Um, so Johnny is currently uh, assistant professor at the bioinformatics division uh, at the Center for Proteomics and Bioinformatics at Case Western Reserve University. Um, so he has um, a very interesting uh, background. So he started off with his uh, bachelor's in uh, advanced mathematics in France, followed by a master's degree in software engineering and computer science uh, within the School of Engineering, also in France. And then after that, a uh, PhD in Molecular Biology and Bioinformatics in, in France. France. And then a master's degree in statistics at Case Western in the US. Um, and uh, you can see that um, this, this has led to a pretty interesting uh, and varied research interest. Um, so you list here uh, that your interests are computational statistical biology with uh, emphasis on uh, data mining methods in high dimensional settings. Um, some of your research focuses are bump hunting, which is today's topic, um, Bayesian model selection with applications to uh, genetic association studies, um, proteomic interaction problems, uh, regularization variant stabilization methods, um, and as well, um, statistical computing, Monte Carlo methods, parallel computing, and complex uh, computational algorithms for large data sets. Um, so, without any further ado. Thanks, Simon. Thanks for the introduction. And thank you for the invitation. Thanks for the department for inviting me and the Division 2, um, especially in this time of the year. When I left, it was like uh, uh, the upper 20s Fahrenheit was blizzards in the East Coast. And when I saw the map when I arrived, there was a map here. In, uh, it was blue and purple all over the states, but except in Florida, where it was orange and yellow. <laughs> so you're really like insulated from, uh, from the rest. It's, it's amazing. So it's really nice to be here. So yeah, like I said, so I was here two years ago, two and a half years ago at the GSM conference uh, that was held here. So that was my first contact with the, the uh, newborn department, the division actually. And uh, I had met already a lot of people. Uh, you had an inauguration party, uh, if you remember, that I was there, that was nice. I've seen how the, department, the division has grown and the students, many students now. So there was none there at that time. So that's nice. So today, yes, uh, survival bump hunting uh, uh, for uh, identification and characterization of informative prognostic subgroups. So this is a uh, joint work with uh, Dr. Rao, Michael LeBlanc, who is uh, at the University of Washington and the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in Seattle, and also a student of mine who was a summer student uh, last summer. So I'm going to give some history and background to this story. Uh, then I'm going to give some example of what people have been doing, including ourselves, over the, the, up to the year 2010, 2012. And then uh, I'm going to give the framework for uh, bump hunting. So, so I'm going to spend some time in that, so it's probably good maybe for students. Uh, and uh, from there I will go into uh, the simulations and the numerical analysis results that we got. And uh, you will see uh, uh, a few results there. And then I will show some uh, pre preliminary results also on real data sets, cancer data sets mostly. Um, this is work in progress. I started actually this, this work uh, last spring, so it's, it's clearly unfinished. Uh, nothing is published yet. So I mean, it's, it's, it's good for that. We can, uh, we can have some, uh, some, some interactions. So first, let me give you some background and uh, the relevance of the project. So yeah, so like I said, I mentioned that it's, um, it's work in progress. And uh, as biostatisticians and epidemiologists in this division department, we need to, to, to search for funding and things that we discuss with the students. And um, importantly, uh, not only the, uh, the approach has to be flawless, that's, uh, that's obvious, but the NIH clearly looks for uh, relevance, clinical relevance for what you're doing. So that's one of the things that the uh, NIH study section BMRD said about the, 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 the project. They agreed that the investigators plan to tackle an important scientific problem with likely clinical impact. So, so what, what is the problem that we picked? What is the niche uh, that, we, that we, we are looking for? So uh, drug companies, FDA, and clinicians 
uh, thing to develop, approve, and use uh, treat the best treatment possible that are the most efficient and harmless possible. So we already know that. But when uh, doctors who see incoming patients, cohorts of incoming patients, they may look the same. Uh, they may be diagnosed for the same disease. They may have the same stage of progression if it's cancer, for instance. Um, but we know that they are actually not the same, even though they look the same. Uh, we know that retrospectively because after giving them some treatment, we know that some have more or less res responded, uh, more, more or well responded. And um, also we know that some have been more at risk than others. Some have a better survival, some less. So we know that retrospectively that they were actually not from a homogeneous population in the first place. So the problem is this. Clinicians need to know ahead of time, they would like to know ahead of time uh, to discern the, di the, dis the disparities and the, the, dif the different populations that they come from so that they may be able to tailor their treatments in the best, most efficient way and also harmless way. So if, you are, if they identify you as a good responder, obviously they are not going to give you the most aggressive treatment. And if they know that you are at risk, they may, they may be do the opposite. So these kind of things. So, and the way it's done today, it's, uh, it's clearly not if efficient because this is not addressed in a direct way. And this is the goal of this study is to how to answer that question, how to identify subgroups, subtypes of people in a, for progress, prognostication ahead of time in an efficient way. And we want to address that in a direct way. So, so at the time we were writing uh, the revision of the grants, this came in the news. The FDA made the news. Uh, they withdrew uh, the, F the uh, Avastin, which is a uh, rush uh, drugs for uh, metastatic breast cancer, uh, precisely for its association with the chemotherapy uh, baclitaxel. And uh, the, uh, the promise was that the association would actually increase our overall survival. But in fact, instead of that, it increased progression-free survival, but not the overall survival. And this, in addition to this, it was known that this drug has severe side effects. So they decided to, to remove it after, I think, like two to three years on the market. Um, and that created like, a, like an outcry in the, uh, the community because this drug was known to work very well in some, in some women, but not in all of them. That was the problem. So when it was withdrawn from the room, withdrawn from the market, the, uh, the, some doctors were saying, but you just cannot do that. Even patients were saying, you just can't do that because it works very well on some patients. So you're going to hurt these people. But the FDA commissioner, uh, Hamburg, uh, Margaret Hamburg said that, but the problem is that without a reliable indicator of which woman with breast cancer might benefit, we are unable to leave it on the market. And let me quote her, many breast cancer specialists said that Avastin, that's a commercial name for this drug, does appear to work very well for some patients. And some advocates have said that the drug should be left on the market for the sake of those patients. But there was no way to determine in advance who those patients were, so many women would use the drug wrongly. So, and, and this came in the news just when we were submit, about to submit the grant. And we were writing the grant to do that. So that was like, wow, perfect timing. And yeah, also coincidentally, in December of that year, in, at, at UM here, there's a cancer center uh, group uh, who was also working on that drug. And they were conducting an health economic study to assess the cost effectiveness of this association in this indication. And uh, what they found is this. Uh, this, uh, ben, so, so, plus this drug is not cost effective in treating MBC. Value-based pricing and the development of biomarkers to improve patient selections are needed to better, to better define the role of the drug in this population. So that was another confirmation, a second witness that, yes, this is an important thing to do. And I will make the bold statement that these kind of problems exist for every drug on the market, and probably every disease. So this is a, a view, a schematic view of uh, how I see our prognostication today. So suppose you have cancer patient uh, incoming to a doctors and they have been uh, uh, diagnosed for a disease at some point here. 
the disease occur here, for instance, then they are diagnosed, and then they decide to be treated for. And based on their um, histopathological grade, for instance, they are staged. So assuming that they all come from the same populations, if they come at this point and they are stage one, well, you give them treatment one. If they come at this point and they are stage two, you give them this treatment, et cetera, et cetera. But we know that it's a little bit more complicated than that. Because if you look at, for instance, time two, instead of having homogeneous populations, you may have actually uh, a mixture of distributions, people coming from different populations. And they may look all the same. So if you see, for instance, at time two, they may all look stage two. So if you treat them with the same treatment, if you ignore actually this, this, this mixture, or if you, are, if you have not identified it, you may suspect it, but you have not identified it, all patients are seen identically, and they will receive the same prognosis and the same treatment. And if you do that, two, two bad things can happen. Because if you are already a good responder, for, for instance, and you give them a harsh treatment, then you're going to hurt these people. They may, uh, they may follow this curve instead of following a more flat curve. And conversely, if you already are an, a bad responder, and you give them the same treatment, instead of having a good response, you may have a very flat uh, response. So, so clearly, there is a need to have a good prognostication early. That's what I said here. And uh, histopathology has, has had some success. I'm not saying it's all wrong. It's, it's, it has a lot of success in the early 90s, um, and it, it, even in prognostications. But we know that we can do better and uh, with the uh, with the advent of the new t uh, technologies and uh, the new assays, uh, high throughput assays, we know that we can interrogate a lot more markers and genes and have a better resolution to do a better job. So that's, that's a background. So for instance, that's what people have been doing, for instance, in breast cancer. That's, number, that's my first example here. Back in the early 2000s, uh, the famous group at Stanford here who studied this breast cancer and using microarray gene expression data, which was what they were doing mostly at that time, they could identify subtypes of, for some reason, the, it's not showing here. OK, so I had a, <laughs> I had a, a picture here, but it's not showing, so I'm sorry. So it's, um, so none of the pictures are showing now. <laughs> All right, so. Uh, I was showing here uh, a clustering analysis where people used, uh, that's what they were using at mostly at the time, and doing so they could identify these subgroups. And unfortunately, uh, it's, it's showing on my computer, but I'm sorry for that. So they could, what they did is that having done, having identified these groups, then they went back to the survival response that they had, and they were looking for a clinical relevance of these groups to see if there was a, anything. And th that's what they did. Uh, they could see uh, a better survival for actually uh, these groups as opposed to the basal, like triple negative. And also, they could see a uh, difference in the relapse free survival between luminal A and B, and also uh, uh, a significant difference in the uh, median survival for the two ER plus positive. So, I hope it's not the same for all the slides. Um, OK, so I uh, will see. Uh, and other groups I followed up, like this is uh, a Dutch group here who published some kind of study, follow-up studies. Um, and moving forward, when the RNA-seq uh, technology became available, people uh, interrogated more markers, not just uh, gene expression, but they looked into uh, for instance, inherited variants, copy numbers, and SNPs polymorphism, and also uh, together with uh, acquired somatic copy numbers, but also uh, somatic mutations, it's also true, together with gene expression. And again, using uh, clustering analysis, they could identify subgroups which actually had better or poorer prognosis. So this, this thing has been done more and more over the last, see this, is, this was published in Nature in 2012. So even recently, this is what people were doing, but always using clustering unsupervised methods. And further down the road, even now, there is the Cancer Genome Atlas Pan Cancer Project, 
where the idea is to have a comprehensive molecular portrait of uh, the disease, so in case, in this example of breast cancer. So the idea is to, to bore information across different types of cancer to study your own cancer of interest, and also to integrate many platforms of assay, not just gene expression or um, copy numbers, genomics, but also uh, DNA methylation, so some epigenetics events, microRNA, uh, expressions which modulate stability of uh, uh, messenger RNA and uh, translations, and also proteomics. So, so the idea is to have a, a better, uh, a more comprehensive view of, of, of your, the cancer you are interested in. And, but the goal is always the same, is try to correlate with an outcome. And uh, so another example is this glioblastoma multiform. So it, ac so it accounts for 15% of all brain tumors. Uh, the incidence is three to four per 100,000 uh, worldwide. Um, this is how it's treated, and the median survival rate is 15 months, five years survival rate for 4%, so it's terrible. So what they did recently, again, at 2010, Cancer Cell, a big journal, they, uh, they could identify using clustering, again, four groups, and so pro-neural, neural, classical, mesenchymal. And this is a point. Uh, these four groups, you see, if you give them a treatment in red or in black, which are, the red is a, the more intensive, aggressive, the black is less intensive, you can clearly see that the pro-neural and neural they don't care. They, uh, they don't respond. But as opposed to classical or mesenchymal type. So if you ignore these types, you clearly, uh, you clearly give a, uh, the wrong drug uh, to these people or this, this group. So this, this is a kind of a example also of how to, uh, to tailor the treatments. And this is, this is our study in, that we published in 2012 uh, about cancer cancer. That's, that's the thing I was mentioning with the, to the students before. Uh, so we looked at, uh, we use our supervised method for identifying bumps in the data or modes it's called local, local sparse bump hunting, which we published in 2010. But we applied the methods to a colon cancer gene expression data sets uh, from our collaborators, the uh, cancer geneticist uh, Marko, Sandy Markovic at Case Western. And um, so this is uh, the data set that we have. We, s we had four different types, four different classes. The last group, the more advanced one, is the one for which we have a presence of metastasis, distant metastasis in the lung and, and the liver. And um, the, the goal was to identify subtypes there because it was suspected that they were existing from uh, clinical data that they had, uh, different survival rates, um, different response. So they suspected that some heterogeneity was there. And sure enough, when we applied the methods to the METS group, metastatic group, we could find a bump by support for uh, a difference in the survival. So I a difference for, uh, I'm sorry, for, um, for, for the groups, for two subgroups in the METS. So, and this was correlated also by using density estimation. You can see that the blue are the METS, and they were actually, um, you can see two groups forming there. So what is, the, uh, what is Z3 and Z4, the axes? Mean? So, yeah, so this, this is uh, projected in the uh, principal component space. Um, in fact, it's the uh, sparse principal component space where um, we use a sparsity. So that's the third principal component? Yes, and the third and fourth, yes. Uh, so in that space, this is where we find actually the box. So I'm going to talk about that in a moment more in details. But the point was this, is that using the survival data that we had for this, group, for this, for this, um, for this uh, data set as well, we are uh, in an unsupervised way, we try to see if the groups that we found had any clinical relevance. And indeed, we, we found something that, you see, if you are in the, uh, if you have the bumps in nature, the green, uh, for instance, uh, in the B, you actually better off. And we found that in all the groups, including from the Mets, the Cs, the Ds, and the Bs. So, so that signature actually uh, was a good prognostic signature that we could trace back all the way to the early stages. So it has some clinical value for uh, prognostics. Okay, so the MF study is uh, twofold. Uh, if I, 
it's one, the first aim is actually uh, has two facets which are tied together because they are done simultaneously. It's to identify extreme subgroup of patients, it doesn't have to be cancer, but cancer patient if you want, with respect to a survival outcome. So we're going to talk about survival bump hunting today. And we want to characterize them with uh, the markers. So not only we want to know to distinguish these two populations, but we want to do more than that. We want to be able to characterize them. And the direct benefits, well, obviously, are we are going to do better in therapy, but also in the biology, because if we can characterize them, then we can identify uh, mutations, copy numbers, pathways that are affected. So we can, we can have some insight into the biology as well. So the bump hunting framework now. Um, so, um, so assume a supervised uh, setting, all right, so move, think away now from clustering, uh, pattern recognitions, and, uh, so, and think of what people have been doing, and uh, assume a supervised problem um, with a response of interest for the moment, assume univariate, uh, which can be discrete or continuous, censored or not, also with missing value if you want. And what people have been doing so far is uh, using a mixture of parametric distribution to address this problem of mode hunting, uh, non-parametric density estimation, and all the more algorithmic methods, the non-parametric rule induction methods, which is the one that we are going to focus on. The one that we focus on is uh, called, uh, it's also called a recursive peeling procedure. And it's, uh, it was originally designed by Friedman and Fisher in 1990. It's a kind, a key, the problem of bump hunting is akin to outlier detection, uh, subgroup finding, and local global, local global extremum finding. But it's, if you think about it, we, this is important to understand that we are not trying to do classification uh, or regression we are, or, or clustering. For instance, uh, classification or even clustering, you have to assume beforehand a certain number of clusters, which in fact you don't know. Uh, classification is the same. You have to assume that the class labels that you are given are true and that there's no more, no more, no less. So, so, so that's not what we are trying to do here. We are trying to find actually hidden subgroups, hidden classes, uh, hidden clusters, without assuming anything beforehand about their numbers. So the, the setup, so, so assume a superior problem, uh, assume that you have a high ID observation, Y, I, X, I, uh, drawn from a, an unknown, unknown joint PDF, probability of Y and X, with the usual notation that uh, X is a, a multivariate P, is a multivariate P-dimensional uh, real value random variable, continuous or discrete, uh, with these observations, X, I, where x i is a, is a p-variate uh, random vector, and y is a univariate real va value response with these observations. And, uh, and suppose we are interested in some property of the, the values of y at given x. We need to characterize the conditional probability of y given x, which can be described if completely by its first moment, okay, the expectations, conditional expectation of y given x, the things that we discussed with, uh, is during lunch with uh, Dan here. And um, so you can re rewrite the, uh, the response variable as this. So it's, it's, it's uh, therefore, uh, it can be rewritten as an expectation of y given x plus some noise, contaminating noise. And the problem of, uh, of interest, which is to characterize, uh, to, to, to know something about the value of y at each x, is to estimating this target function. That, it's, to, it's therefore esti an estimation problem, and uh, and once you have you have this estimate, then uh, to ascertain the, the property of interest. But this is a formidable task in a, in high dimension because um, uh, you know it's uh, uh, it's it's impossible to uh, to do that in a straightforward way. Uh, so there are heuristic methods, uh, of course, algorithmic methods to to go around, but it's. It's, it's something very difficult. People have been doing that in low dimensions in the early 80s for uh, regression and density estimations. Uh, but, but clearly it's a harder task in high dimension. 
And what we want to do in bump hunting is to actually answer the question as, uh, what is the uh, region R, the target region R of the support of the uh, inputs, which is not necessarily contiguous, uh, where we have actually the average value of uh, the response uh, over that region is uh, expected to be larger or smaller than its average value over the entire space. So without loss of generality, we are going to assume a maximum instead of extremum, because a minimum is just uh, uh, the negative side of uh, a, a maximum. So in the continuous case, we can write the, uh, the mean of uh, the response as this. And you can see that this quantity here, if p of x is uh, the probability, uh, the unknown uh, joint probability density distribution, joint probability density, this joint probability distribution function of x, uh, this quantity is um, over the uh, domain r is going to be uh, bounded between 0 and 1. Therefore, this quantity is greater than uh, the numerator. Therefore, on this region that you're looking for, the expectation is going to be higher than the one that you would have on the entire uh, input space. Another quantity of interest is the size of this support, which we denote by beta r. And um, obviously, there's a trade-off between the size of that support and the and the, the mean of the response that you will get. I mean, if the support gets uh, smaller and smaller, then of course the, you can expect to have a higher or sm smaller uh, uh, expectation. Uh, but, but you don't want that support to be too small either, because you don't want to catch uh, noise either. All right. So if the support is too small, you may, uh, you may find uh, some local maximum which are not true. So there's a trade-off between the two, okay. So another formulation and more concept and notation about bump hunting is, so suppose that Sj is a support for the GS variable Xj, such as the entire input, the entire input support S can be written as the Cartesian project of uh, the Sj over all, over all variables. And denote by small sj the uh, unknown subset of value of variable xj corresponding to the unknown support of the target regions. Okay, and the goal is to uh, to find this subset, the value subset sj corresponding to xj, and the subspace b, which can be written as the Cartesian product here, such that the probability written as here corresponds to a probability density or mass of a global or local maximum, and the region b or the subspace B is called in bump and things, uh, it's a p-dimensional uh, hyperrectangle, which is called a box. Okay, so I think, yeah, so now I'm going, after that I'm going to talk about prim. So if you have an equation right now, or oh, well after, I mean. Uh, so that's about the introduction to the bump and thing framework, but like I said, we are interested in a recursive peeling or rule induction method, which is one way to, uh, to solve this problem. Um, so this is, um, this is the one that we uh, are focus, have been focusing on for, some, for a few years now. Uh, it's called the patient rule induction method. So it's a statistical learning method for modern thing, and it's designed to directly estimate the mode by seeking local bump support rather than by constructing the global model. Constructing, like I said, in high dimension, uh, this global model is a, is a formidable task that I don't think anybody knows how to do. So, um, so that's an heuristic to go around this. So it goes like that. This is the algorithmic uh, presentation of PRIM. So you start with uh, all the training data and a maximum box containing all the data. So remember, the box is p-dimensional also. You can think in two dimensions if you wish, but bear in mind that it's p-dimensional. And you shrink the bug by compressing uh, one face at a time or one dimension at a time to peel off the proportion of uh, called alpha of observation having either the highest or the lowest value of a predictor g. And you choose the, the direction of peeling j, the dimension j, for which you have the highest response mean in the remaining box. All right. So you look at all the uh, possible uh, direction, one, at one after the other, and you pick the one for which you have the highest 
increasing the mean in the resulting box. And you repeat that until you reach a, a minimum uh, number of observations in the box, which, which is a, a certain parameter that you have to fix. And there is another step which is called, so this is called peeling, but then you have another step called pasting, which is like a backfitting uh, feature to prevent yourself from overfitting. Just like you do when you, you use trees, you can grow, 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 and, but you can also prune uh, to avoid uh, overfitting issues. So you repeat that until you reach this minimum support, and this is the first box you get. Once you have your first box, you remove it from the data, and then you repeat the whole procedure again until you find the second box. You remove the second box, and you go on and on until you find the last box for which you have a, the mean of that box, which is below a certain threshold, usually like the average mean or some threshold that you have set up. And this collection of box here, BM for M equal 1 to M, is called the, uh, the covering loop. And each box corresponds to potentially uh, like a, a local maximum, if you think about it. And I have an example here in two dimensions. So you start with the whole data. Suppose you have a, a bump here. And we, we show here an example with only one bump. So you peel off in this direction. Then, so yes, I guess here and here. Then again here. Then along x2 then along x1, etc., all the way down until you reach uh, a minimum box support. Then you remove that box and you do that again. So suppose you had another, another bump somewhere, it will converge to that box again, to that bump again. All right? Why, why are the red points say in maximum or minimum? minimum? Why, why is it supposed to be true? It, it doesn't say anything about maximum or minimum. It's, it's, it, it's either way. Well, here it's a class. It's, a, it's actually an example with a two-class label. Okay. So you have actually two classes. Here it's uh, like one, oh, the one okay. and zeros. Yeah, yeah, it's a two-class problem. Yeah. So, so is the first box you uncover the maximal? Yes, the first box always find the, the highest maximum, the highest maximum. and then the yeah, other. Then yeah, then you go down. That's why the first box is usually the most interesting one. Um, but not always. Or potentially the largest thing. Yeah, but, but not always, because if you, you know that there are some, some mixture or some local maxima somewhere, then you want to look for the other ones too. Right, sure. Uh, could, could you go back? So what is the advantage, you mentioned trees, so what is the advantage of doing this than just growing a regular um, classification tree? Because it would immediately identify that region. It's perfect, right? It's parallel to the coordinate axes and everything. A few splits and you, you have um, perfect separation of the data. Well, uh, the goal of using this tree is to find tender nodes where which are as homogeneous as possible. Well, the tree is not
I more formalism about um, the procedure? Um, so for the sake of time, I think it's better to move forward. So remember that there are two parameters, alpha and beta. One that's which control the, uh, the patients. That's what's called patient. Because you can make this beta as patient as possible by making alpha as small as beta. Not quite, though, because the variance of the box increase with one of alpha. Them. So if alpha is too small, you hurt yourself too. So, so, it, so there is some trade-off there. And beta is the, the, remember the minimal box support for the peeling loop. So these are two important meta parameters. And uh, yeah, so that's the second. And the, the, yes, the, so I talk about the, uh, the the peeling fraction, which controls the patients, and the beta controls the uh, stopping stopping wall. And uh, at the end of the day, you come up with uh, something. Let me back up a second. We, you come up with this kind of rule where you describe or characterize your, your, your support with respect to uh, the predictor space. So you come up with this, this, these rules, uh, disjunctive rule, and you have m of them, each one for each box, remember? And each box itself is, uh, is a result of a peeling loop sequence. So it's, uh, it's um, which uh, describes the, um, uh, the support of, of, the, uh, of the bump or, or the box. And at the end, you, you, the solution of the problem, the solution region R, is the union of, of all these regions which can be written this way. Uh, this way if uh, you deal with a real, data, a real value uh, predictors, because in that case it's an interval. So here's an example of um, pasting. Remember, there is a pasting step after the peeling loop. So, so pasting is not just undoing peeling. <laughs> All right, so otherwise it would be a bit silly. Uh, so just like in trees, uh, pruning is not just ungrowing. All right. So, so here in P equal two, for instance, uh, suppose you, you, this is where you start. So you peel around x1, x2, x1, x2, x1, no, I'm sorry, I'm, I messed up, x2, then x1, and that's the end of the peeling, for instance. Then it doesn't necessarily use one again, where I stopped, and then one, and then two, one, no, it, it can use two to increase the mean, and then one. And if it does increase the mean by pacing, then it does so until some point. Wait. So, so, so it moves out of the dimensions that you were working on? But I'm sorry? I so, so the pacing is not necessarily in along the same two dimensions that you were No, no, it's, it's in the same dimension. It is well, the, I mean, the same x's. It, it's, not in, it's, a, it's in the same space, but it doesn't choose the reverse order of peeling. Oh, OK. okay. So, so it's, it's an ordered sequence here. The order matters here, and just for the uh, yeah for the records, uh, so you know that there are two types of uh, peeling: the the unconstrained or undirected peeling, which is the one that I've been describing so far, which leads to this kind of uh, boxes. But there is the un the constrained one, uh, which is the one that I have uh, I finished implementing actually. Uh, this this is not ready yet. Not that it's not interesting, but uh, I think both are interesting. Uh, in terms of uh, the response that you get, see the, the solution that you get is not the same necessarily. So this this may be more characterized, I would say, but the interpretation here is a little bit easier. So I think both should be available. So right now, everything I'm going to show actually in the numerical analysis and the real data analysis is using uh, the the constraint the constraint version. That's uh, like I said, it's a work in progress. And this is a, a simulation setup where I showed how it works. So I simulated a mixture of two bivariate here, uh, normal distribution, and uh, and I and I run the and I run the code. Uh, so this is how it's set up. So I have a thousand sample, one third uh, I think, one third of, I guess here, two third here of the data here. Uh, these are the choice of meta parameters, and this is the sequence of box. So remember the, the, the covering loop BM going from one, so it hit from 19 boxes. So the first one that it found is, is this one here. 
then it, it then it finds the second one, etc. And then at some point it finds this, the second one. So it's like finding a global maximum and then a, and a local one. So this is in the predictor space, but what we did also is to look into uh, the principal component space. And obviously, you see, we get a uh, different box shaped. Actually, the volume of these boxes is, uh, is a lot smaller. It's, it can be seen here. So this is the work that was presented in your division in September by Daniel Diaz. Yeah. So this is a work in, um, in progress that we want to, uh, to send it. And the interesting thing about that is that the, the, uh, it's a kind of paradoxical result because we show in this paper uh, a theoretical result that actually uh, the principal component space is providing better uh, inputs or predictors for uh, correlating with the response than the original inputs, which is really paradoxical when you think about it because principal components are not using the response at any time to be built. So, so it's a very interesting piece of work, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Yeah, just for the record also, there is, like, there is also a probabilistic model for, uh, for prim, just like it exists also for uh, uh, classification and regression trees. Uh, you can write it as an algorithmic form, but also as a model, like a regression model. F of x can be written as a summation of, of, of a whole determinal node of the indicative function of who is in the node times the mean if it's a, a continuous response or times a, a, a majority vote for a class label in the discrete case. And the same way we can do that also, in a similar way we can do that for a prim. We can write it as a, the probability function of y given x given some other parameters. You remember this is the, 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 con the conditional probability that I was talking about in the mod hunting, the p of y given x, it's there. And it can be written as a product of probability distribution of each uh, boxes itself. So that's very useful, that's the work of Chipman and Wu at the University of Waterloo in Canada, uh, because they were trying to, to, uh, to create um, what they call a Bayesian assi model assisted uh, prim. So they needed a model like that, of course and they uh, showed that they got better predictions. So, yeah, so let's talk a bit about uh, commonalities between recursive peeling and recursive partitioning. That is between uh, box induction uh, and rule induction methods like prim and, and cart classification on regression trees. So both are rule induction methods. So the generic both check regions which, which can be described by rules. Both are recursive algorithms both have backward fitting features like I, I told about. Both can be formulated as a model. But clearly the boxes that, that, that are produced by partitioning methods, even though they are box shapes like, the, like prim, um, in the case of recursive peeling, they can be overlapping. In fact, in the example, I don't know if you noticed, but it shows actually they, they can overlap. As opposed to recursive partitioning because the uh, the regions are disjoint, they form, they form a partition of the space. Okay, so the, uh, the union is a space, the empty set is excluded, and the, they are disjoint, there is no intersection. So they are not overlapping. Another difference is the goal, of course, that's, that's the question of Hemant. Uh, well, in, in recursive partitioning methods like cards, decision trees, you, you attempt to model the target function over the entire data space by making the response average in each region as different as possible. So as different between regions, but as homogeneous as possible within a region, of course. Rec recursive peeling methods are doing something different. We are trying to find an extreme response support region in which a response average is as extreme as possible. And there are some weaknesses, some trade-off between the two. Uh, if you, I'm not saying that one is better than the other. I don't think we should say that. I think they are kind of complementary because if you're interested in uh, finding uh, multiple strata in the data, I think that uh, partitioning methods are probably uh, better. And there are ensemble versions like random forests, even, even more so. Uh, and also their interpretability is a little bit easier because they, they are, they are, the boxes remember, I'm sorry, the, um, in the decision trees, it's, it's organized in a tree. So the interpretation uh, at the end, uh, uh, is, is easier than a collection of box which may seem unrelated with each other. The, the other thing about a tree is that because it is a partition, yeah. 
you can use it for prediction because if you get a new data point, it has to fall into one of the yeah. partition regions and that's your predicted value. Yes. But with the overlapping regions, it's not a prediction method, right? It's a, yeah, it's it's a bump hunting method. Yeah, I guess, yeah, in terms of predictions, it's, um, yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Another difference is, uh, so that is now in the advantage of PRIM, which is known to be patient, is that recursive partitioning methods are notor notoriously greedy. So algorithmically, they are very different. Uh, and their goal is, is, is also uh, different. So, OK, survival PRIM and bump hunting now, survival. So we focus uh, on a single survival right sensor outcome with the usual assumption of non-informative censoring and proportional hazards. Um, uh, what do you write here? Yes, yeah, so just like uh, in survival trees, for instance, we, uh, we, have to have, we have to use our peeling criterion for, um, I'm sorry, splitting criterion for uh, this deciding in which, uh, uh, which, uh, which variable you are going to split on. Um, this criterion can be used in a similar way for box induction. So in that case, I would call that a peeling criterion instead of a splitting criterion. But you can log rank test have been used extensively with uh, trees, and they can be used also for peeling criterions here. But I advocate, and that's what I'm using here, for bump hunting that log hazard ratios statistics are certainly a good, a good thing to do too. But there are more. Uh, you can use, uh, I know uh, Hemant worked a lot on that, on conservation of events. This is also what he has implemented in his random survival forest, uh, which is perfectly fine. In fact, I will show examples with that. You will see. But some obviously, uh, these residuals, survival residuals, are also uh, possible to use. In fact, I think in, uh, in CART, this is uh, in, in the report version of CART in the R package. I think this is what they use. So the endpoints that we looked at are uh, disease-free survival, uh, uh, progression-free survival, metastasis-free survival, overall survival. So you can, usually that's what people use. And we look at uh, what I call the event-free probability, or the probability to reach event at a certain time. So you, you, you have a certain time that you're interested in, and you look at the probability of uh, uh, not, contract, not, not seeing the event. Okay, but sometimes you may not see that event if the if the probability a survival probability curve is, I mean, uh, end up here, in which case I compute automatically this uh, this point. I compute the time of this uh, ex extremity of the, the distribution. And 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 conversely, uh, we look at also at the event free time or the time to reach a certain endpoint probability. So P is fixed here, and we look at the time. And this is typically the median survival time that people have been using, or the, um, um, yes, that's, um, that's, that's. So the median survival time would correspond to the, to the median 50% uh, probability there. And again, uh, if, 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 if you don't observe it, because, for instance, uh, it goes it goes like that. It follows. Then I compute these values, and then I report that. And the other things we looked at at the log hazard ratio and the log rank test. So this is a simulation that uh, the simulation designed. So with the usual notation, I, I simulate uh, the data as a p variate multi as a p multivariate normal distribution. And I use uh, the general censoring framework for survival. So with the usual notation, notation nothing, uh, nothing new here. And I use an exponential model for the survival time. And the mean of that survival, the, I'm sorry, the parameter lambda for the, for the uh, distribution of mean one over lambda can be estimated uh, directly from the, uh, uh, the treatment effect of, uh, in the simulation. And uh, for this, as far as the censoring is concerned, uh, people have been using uh, a lot of uh, uniform distribution 
uh, or from zero to some B um, parameter. And uh, you can use also a Bernoulli uh, random variables with some probability of success. So this is what I've, I've used in my simulation. So, so yeah, so, so far or so in this talk, I've been talking about uh, low dimensional problems. We are, we are not there yet to, to deal with uh, the high dimensional problem, which we are going to do because it's part of our, our aims. Uh, but so far, we are just trying to fight I wrote the code to see if it works and tested it on low dimensional problems. So this is what you're going to see today uh, for the moment. So P equals three. Uh, uh, so this is how I set up the, uh, the, the p-variate, uh, so the trivariate here, uh, multivariate normal distribution. Uh, fix B equals three and I checked that it corresponds to approximately 50% probability of success. Um, and yeah, and so, the mo so I, I tested three different models where uh, the variables enter, depending on how the variables enter into the model. So I have the model one where they all enter with some, co some coefficients here. A model two where only one, I'm sorry, two out of three enter, and one where none of them, it's model with just noise. And we are going to see, um, yeah, and also we, I repeated that a hundred times Um, to get, um, yeah, because at some point I will need uh, to build uh, point estimates of the uh, uh, sample um, mean and confidence intervals. So I need uh, to get the sampling distribution for, the, for that, so I use Monte Carlo for that. So here's uh, the first result. Uh, so here, here is how it goes. So these are at the top the three variables, x1, x2, and x3. And this trajectory uh, is called peeling trajectory. I read from the right to left, from the full box where you start until you reach. Uh, and they correspond to the first box here. Okay, I'm just looking at the, showing you the peeling loop corresponding to the first box. So, for instance, so for this variable, remember the coefficients, it has a negative signs and two positive here. So that's model one, and you see that uh, it goes down it goes here. Up here. So as I peel. What I see is that the, uh, the minimum even free probability st starts to go down. The minimum free time even free time also goes down. The log hazard ratio increases as expected, and the log run test trajectory also increases as expected. So when you reach down the, uh, the box of high risk in that case, uh, you see that uh, you have to you have to uh, increase the values of x1 and x2 and decrease the values of x3. So the, the box that you, you may be interested, so you see you have the steps here, and you may say, okay, so this is the one I, I'm looking at. Uh, the description of the support is here. Uh, these are the estimated uh, minimum, uh, minimum probability and maximum time the log hazard ratio, the log run statistic, and the size of the support, which is like 4.4% uh, of the data right there. So it's so, okay? Yeah, so, so briefly, uh, each trajectory is estimated by a step function. Uh, we, lo we look at the first box of the covering loop. Uh, it is read from right to left. Uh, it's only constraint pinning without pasting right now. Um, uh, it's, it's actually, pasting is available for the type of response, but not yet for survival. Um, and uh, yes, it's, it's, these are, because it's constrained, these are mono, monotonic curves. You don't see them, all right, going, going by and um, and, and they converge to the uh, coordinate value of the mode, which is, uh, in that case, I use a, a mean zero, so by multivariate standard normal, so the mode is, uh, is at the origin. And they, they see they converge approximately to the, to the, uh, to the, to the coordinate values of the, of the mode. Yes. Uh, okay, so let, let me, so, 
aside from peeling trajectories, we can look at uh, some viable importance, which is uh, this, this is called a trace plot, where we plot actually for each variable how they are being used and how they are uh, related to each other. So as you peel from right to left, you see that you, you use uh, x2, uh, no, probably x1 first and x2, then further down uh, x3, I'm sorry, I mixed up, x1 is here. So you use first the x2 here, then maybe x3, then x1, etc. And this is what is plotted here. So the first used are probably the most important ones. And, and you will see later also another interesting feature in this plot is that you can, you can tell also which variables are more important than the others on, based on the flat, uh, how flat their profile is. Yes, so this is reminiscent to, uh, if, you, uh, if you have look at the literature about variable selections, this is reminiscent of the um, uh, selective shrinkage of uh, variable coefficients that have been uh, used in, uh, in LARS and also the, for, for the lasso and the elastic net. Uh, you have this uh, all pass of uh, uh, shrinkage parameters um, uh, for that is described for each uh, variable and for uh, for the purpose of variable selection and the concept of uh, uh, variable importance also comes from the uh, the uh, the field of uh, ensemble trees and uh, de decision trees uh, that uh, Hemant has worked a lot on including uh, Bryman of, of course so there is a, a connection there which is which is quite interesting also uh, which I think we should look at. So this is uh, the corresponding descriptions of Kaplan-Meier estimates of the survival distributions for each step. So we had 28 steps. So I had to bring everything in the box, okay? And then you see some splitting. You see a, you see a, a, a second group forming. You see, so the, and at some point, if you actually go probably too much down the road, well, you, 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 your, your support is too small and you don't have anything in the box. So there are some overfitting issues that I'm going to talk about. Should we believe all these results? So if I ask a question, probably not. <laughs> uh, so we know already for some time that if we use the same data for model development and if we use it for uh, estimations, uh, we are doing something wrong because everything is biased, severely biased sometimes. Man. And, um, and also, uh, not only that, but you can have excess bias. So I, I could go as far back as Tip Shimmery's paper, but I'm, I'm not sure. I, I think it could be even f older than that. I don't know, even if you know. But I mean, the literature about that has been, uh, I think, prolific. So to, 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 to deal with this, cross-validation has been a uh, uh, design and used to reduce these issues of underfitting and overfitting. So in, in our case, um, in, in the survivor prim bump hunting, I use, uh, so cross-validation, so I use uh, like an internal first uh, step of cross-validation for estimating. So on the training data set, what I want to do is to uh, cross-validate the number of peeling steps of the peeling loop the number of steps, right? And, um, and doing so, I can, use, uh, I can do that with respect to a maximization of log hazard ratio of, or of these statistics, or I can use another criterion like the minimization of prediction error and using, for instance, uh, Harold's uh, C concordance index uh, for that matter. Once, and then once I have determined on the training set uh, my cross-validated lengths of the peeling loop. I use that length, I go back to the training data, I model with that length, and then I use a test set to make my predictions, or my, estim my estimations. Not prediction, estimations, I'm sorry. Now, the problem is that also cross-validation has been shown to be quite viable, if I careful cross-validation, so this whole thing is repeated actually uh, B times, and uh, the results are averaged. 
So B can be like uh, 10. I, I went up to 100 here. Now, uh, the problem also with average regular cross-validation is that it's not always applicable because um, if, if your sample size is too small and you, the number k of fold is too large, then, then you're going to, to have also too biased results. So there are ways to deal with that with Tip Shirani and Efron published the pre-validation approach to deal with that. Um, but another problem is, is that if I want to estimate a, a survival curve, survival distribution with, with Kaplan-Meier, I cannot do that with just averaging uh, cross-validate results over the fault. So I came up with, uh, so average cross-validation is what uh, the regular way of doing cross-validation. But I came up with this, what I call combined cross-validation. And it's replicate version where I, I repeat the whole thing. Um, by actually, um, what you do is actually you, uh, you estimate on each uh, test set uh, the results. And then you, you actually pull all the test set together at the end. And then you build, uh, your, uh, you, you do your estimate of uh, Kaplan-Meier on the all combined test set. That way, you, you actually um, come, back, come up with a complete um, data set of size n, because each test set has been used only once. So you can combine them. They are all independent. They, are, they form the whole data set that you, you started from. And uh, so you, your sample size is, is obviously larger than just using a fold. And on top of that, you can build a Kaplan-Meier estimate on the whole data, all right? So I, now, this is cross, K-fold cross-validation, but uh, if this has been used because uh, simple uh, full cross-validation uh, is not always possible also because uh, sample size are not, are not big enough. So we use K-fold cross-validation. So I have, some details on how to compare average cross-validation and combined cross-validation here. So, the, the rate, so we are not going to go into this level of detail for the sake of time, but we can keep that for the discussion. Now, another thing to cross-validate upon is the p-values because uh, the samples are not uh, did, uh, they are not independent anymore. Uh, so the observations are not independent anymore if uh, if you use uh, uh, cross-validation. So. Uh, the null distribution uh, for uh, the, the log rank statistics, the chi-square with one degree of freedom is not applicable anymore. So I use permutation scheme to compute the p-values there. So just bear that in mind. Now look at the, let's look at the results after cross-validation. So, so in green, uh, yeah, in green is the combined cross-validation, in blue is the replicate, the average, and in red the non-cross-validated. This is model one. So here in this model all the variables are in involve, okay? They, are, they all enter the model. So what happens is that you see the profile tends to be actually uh, smoother. You don't, it's not as wiggly. And they are also a little bit flatter. So if it starts, usually if it starts low, it's, it, it, it starts a little bit higher. If it started higher, it ends a bit lower. And the estimates actually cross-validate, converge to a more accurate uh, estimate of the bump or the coordinate. Um, and also the curves, the cross-validated curves, they all are shorter, which was expected also. See, we have 21 steps instead of 28, it was. Mm -hmm. So uh, clearly we have protected ourselves from overfitting there, okay? <coughs> and, uh, and apart from the log rank test trajectory, the, the two cross-validation scheme actually uh, agree uh, pretty much, which is reassuring. I'm not so sure what's happening here, actually, uh, to be honest. He, uh, we can discuss that later. And these are the trajectory cross-validated. Oops. In, uh, the dotted lines are the cross-validated ones. So they, they end up a little bit before, as you can see. And, and there are some differences with non, in, in the way they are used, huh, clearly. But what's most, and these are the profiles, so you have a shorter profiles. And, um, and the p-values are, these are the p-values here. So 
So, but what's more interesting is our result with model two. Remember model two, variable three is, is does not enter the, in the model. And look at that. The, uh, if you don't cross validate, this variable is being used when in fact it's noise. All right, so, so clearly cross validation is important here. And model three, but none of them is, are supposed to enter into the model. And yet, in red, you can see that all of them were used <laughs> without cross validation. So, and, and, and when you cross validate, the, the profile is flat, which is exactly what we expect. And here, the, uh, these, re these log hazards are meaningless. They are even uh, negative at some point. <coughs> so, so nothing is, is meaningful eh, here, as expected. And the survival curves, they all overlap. Oops. Ah, sorry. They all overlap, you see. And the p-values are non-significant. So that's for model three. And the, the trajectory profiles are all flat in that case. So that works well. Um, and now here I compare, compare together the models, one, two, and three. So now the colors are red is model one, blue is two, green is three, okay? So it's doing exactly what expected uh, here. This uh, variable, uh, variable uh, I'm sorry, variable three is not used in model two and three. And variable one, two, and three are not used in model three. So everything is, is okay. Okay, so in conclusion uh, for that part, so we have uh, described an alternative uh, to the standard average k-fold called k-combine which can be used uh, to uh, simulate to average k-fold for, uh, for the purpose that we, we want to do. Um, yeah, I've mentioned that already before, the smoothing and the, and the uh, shortening. Uh, it, it appears that actually average, average k-fold is a bit more conservative than com combined k-fold. That's what I observed actually uh, with the log rank test it was quite flat with average cross validation, even uh, when it in for model one. And I see that uh, cross validation works. Well, okay. Now let me shift gears a little bit and look at comparison to other survival models that exist. So, for survival models, obviously, what comes to mind are Cox proportional hazard regression, um, regression survival tree based models, and ensemble survival tree based models. And I added two more, which are supervised version of unsupervised uh, clustering and PCA. And they are supervised with respect to survival. So I'm going to compare, so I'm going to look at the endpoints that I described before uh, log rank test, log hazard ratio. Uh, minimum even free survival, minimum uh, uh, probability of even free survival, maximum even free time. And uh, so this is how I cross validated everything for each method. That's for the internal loop. So for, the, for this method, I already described it, but I, had, I wanted to have some internal cross validation for each model also. For instance, for Cox, I cross validate with uh, the model size which variable entered into the model. For tree, I cross validated with the size of the tree. For random forest, with uh, the complexity of the forest. For supervised PCA, uh, I cross validated with the respect to the number of PCs and also uh, the threshold for soft thresholding which variables are used in the Cox model. And for clustering, I cross validate with respect to the number of clusters and uh, same thing is a soft thresholding threshold for uh, thresholding the variables that enter into the Cox model. And uh, importantly, uh, uh, unlike bump hunting design, all other methods do not necessarily give directly two extreme probabilistic group. So Prim does that by, de by design, but not necessarily uh, other methods. So we need to come up with some ways to uh, I would say calibrated way to form two groups out of the, the results from these, these other methods. So uh, I discussed with uh, 
other people like uh, Dr. Rao and and uh, there are some papers that have been published where empirically they show that taking the median survival time threshold is is a, is an approximate good way for forming the two groups. Although there is no real uh, theoretical just justification as yet, but uh, we need to start with something, right? So doing so, this is the result here. So I, here I plot um, my, my endpoints of interest, okay? So log hazard ratio, log rank test here, probability of even free survival, medium survival probability time, and the, the, the corresponding one cor where uh, I look at the extremity of the survival curves, you remember? So in green is a recursive peeling, uh, so the survival prime bump hunting. And I use two different uh, uh, peeling criteria, either the log rank test statistics or the log hazard ratio. So log rank test is here, log hazard ratio is here. In red is uh, recursive partitioning or trees, decision trees. In blues are random survival forests with two different uh, splitting criterions, just log rank test or log rank score statistics. In blue, cyan is the Cox regression, supervised PCA here, and supervised clustering in yellow. So where do I start? Uh, log hazard ratio, maybe. So, so, so this is the point, actually, of what we are doing here. Uh, clearly, you can see that the log hazard ratio for survival print bump hunting methods is clearly higher than, than any other, else, which is exactly, I mean, this is expected. That's exactly why we, how we design the stuff. All right? And uh, remember that in, box, in this box plot, the, uh, the, uh, the notches here uh, give the, an approximate 95% 95% uh, confidence interval of the, of the median. So, so it's clearly significant. Huh? For the log run test, though it's interestingly, there's not a, a real big difference. Now for median survival probability time, this is also smaller as expected, right? And for the probability of even free survival, also smaller. So these ratios are consistent, and here also, I mean, uh, this extreme of the survival curves are also smaller here and here than anywhere else. So clearly the method is doing exactly what we are expecting. But interestingly, everybody, any other methods except maybe survival clustering or, or uh, does well also as, as creating two groups, in creating two groups, well separated groups. So, oh yeah, so, so this is the result with uh, the table. Uh, and this is an example out of, so this, this was repeated 100 times, okay? So that's how I, I got this distribution, these sampling distributions for my estimates. And this is one example out of 100 of what I think is going on. So this is a recursive peeling, survival prim, survival prim here also. Uh, trees, Cox regression, Random survival forest with two different splitting criterion, supervised PCA, supervised clustering. So the methods here show that this is the, the high risk group, the bump. Uh, clearly, is uh, first of all is, I mean, it's more extreme. You can see that uh, it, it drops dramatically fast, faster than any other method. But all of them, except maybe survival clustering, all of them does well in terms of separating the group, right? So it's not, so it's, I think it's a good illustration of what the difference between what we are trying to do as opposed to, uh, uh, for instance, uh, tree-based methods. They do well in separating uh, the groups, but not necessarily in finding the extreme, right? So I think uh, we need to think more about that, what's going on here. So what, yes. <laughs> so, um, so recall that partitioning of the covariate space create beans of observations that are assumed to be approximately homogeneous. That is, that is to say, not necessarily extreme with respect to the response. So I'm asking the question, uh, could decision tree-based method possibly perform better in survival bump hunting if they were using different survival splitting criterion rules more adapted to the task, such as log hazard splitting? All right, so I think it's an open question. Um, 
Okay, let yeah, let me uh, let me. Uh, I have to move forward a little bit. And um, this is a summary for uh, results for the comparison to other methods. So, so that's what I've been saying just now that the survival frame bump hunting uh, yield expected higher hazards, shorter even free time, and lower even free probabilities uh, in the high risk group in comparison to other survival models. Uh, this is also true regardless whether uh, the model generates well separated groups or not, apparently. And this remains true also regardless of the splitting rules or the peeling rules that I use. I don't, I mean, with what is available and implemented, I, it doesn't seem to, to matter too much to, to change these results. So survival premium pending appears to be advantageous in the task that we want to do as opposed to uh, existing methods. So this, this is a justification, I think, for these methods. That's, that's the point. Is that it's not that it's doing better, it's just doing something different. The goal is different. This is a real data set analysis, and I'm going to wrap up with this. Uh, so I tr we tried so far uh, 12, 13 data sets, in, or, or in cancer, because that was the focus of the grant. So different types of cancer, different types of outcomes. The blue ones are the ones that we, uh, that I'm going, that we looked at so far. Um, and uh, interestingly, in black are those for which I do not see anything happening. It's, I couldn't find any bumps there. But in red are those for which I found uh, results, patterns, bumps, uh, before cross-validation. But after cross-validation, only three uh, remain significant. So it's, I think it's a good illustration of uh, how you have to, we have to be careful with respect to uh, uh, this problem of overfitting. And uh, this is an example here. So we have here, uh, here we have only two covariates. So it's a very uh, simple uh, example. Uh, that's why I picked that one, that one first. Uh, and the Elston uh, tracks the uh, severity of the disease, and this is so breast cancer, okay? So remember the subtypes of cancer here? And um, as, you, uh, as you peel from right to left, you see that uh, the Elston, uh, the Elston uh, uh, value for grade uh, goes from one to two to three, which, which is exactly what we, we expected to see because it's, it, this is from less severe to more severe. And the subtypes, so we see that actually if you are in the, uh, 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 one, I cannot see the value there. Yes, six is here. So six is here, six, five, four, three, two, one. So if you are normal, six, uh, you, have, you are low risk, as expected. But if you are the basal, which is the uh, triple negative one, you're there. So it is also expected. So this is trace profile, the variable usage. Um, and clearly, you can see that even though you, you cross validate, I believe you still have some overfitting here. I mean, this curve should not go down, should, should be high. And this is a corresponding profile. You can see that in step six. You see, I, I, I would not tr believe that, that step. I think it's, it's still overfitting there. And this is a characterization, OK? That's, that's the other goal, the simultaneous goal that we, we want to do. Not in, we want to um, find the maximum, but also characterize. So these people who have these subtypes, this grade, uh, are actually uh, of worse. Well, here I have to wrap up. So, so here's another example with uh, bladder cancer. We played the same game. This is the, the, the high risk group that we identify. So if you have this age, above this age, uh, this disease status, this type of surgery, etc. So my output is not perfect here because uh, several of them are categorical viable. So I have to, I have to, to, to change that, obviously. <laughs> OK, so I think I, I, I have to wrap up here, all right? Um, I'll just finish with this one. The, um, so what remains to be done is, uh, yeah, I want to do prediction modeling, because although, although it may not be a good idea, because like Heman mentioned, the fact that these boxes overlap, it may not be a great thing to do either. So this is an open question. Um, 
so this is uh, everything is uh, un is constrained. So I want to go into unconstrained and also include pasting. Uh, the option option of direction of search, you know, it's not the same as finding a uh, an extremum in one direction as uh, finding a minimum in the other direction. Like you actually reach from two hands and you don't necessarily uh, reach out the same box. You may find two different solutions starting from two uh, opposite sides. So, so there is something interesting also here. Uh, we can improve the cross-validation design uh, by using uh, other uh, resampling techniques and the bootstrap, for instance to get nearly unbiased uh, estimates. Uh, we can use a prevalution scheme that I mentioned from Tipshirani or Efron. Uh, we can play on the choice of K. Uh, there, are, there are a lot of things to, to do. Um, yes, so I mentioned about variable importance. So there is also a, some impo some, something really interesting to do here because we, we can use this technique also to find the important variables that should enter in the, in the model of finding an extreme in the, in the response. And uh, similarly to a random survival forest, why not imagine a random survival box, ensemble version of uh, these, these, these models? That's also an interesting thing to do, I think. And this uh, will come as an R package, uh, hopefully next year. OK, so with this, I will, uh, some reference, I will thank uh, Michael LeBlanc, who uh, helped me get started with the code at the very beginning. Um, Michael Cho will help me uh, select the data set, the real data set, and will run the code on it. And advising for Dr. Rao and uh, funding from NIH. So with this, I want to thank you for your attention. And I will take some questions.